So next we'll come to the disorders of the stomach. So usually you have a uh, gastritis and that is inflammation of the uh, gastric mucosa or gastric outflow obstruction where it is unable to go to the duodenum. Gastrointestinal ulceration and erosion where there is uh, severe uh, ulcerative disease, intraluminal uh, lesions and infiltrative gastric disease probably due to uh, you know, uh, immune mediated disease or due to uh, tumors. So when we see uh, gastritis, gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. We see lots of cases in our daily practice. It can be acute gastritis. It can be hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. It can be chronic gastritis, or it can be sometimes chronic gastritis associated with helicobacter which is again a very common disease in humans. And we also encounter a lot of cases of helicobacter uh, problem in uh, dogs, which we'll see later. So pathophysiology of uh, gastric disease said there will be severe inflammation, there will be ulceration, there can be obstruction, there can be a neoplasia, um, you know, uh, uh, going in the way of uh, motility and uh, absorption of the uh, uh, stomach. So what are the manifestations of um, the disease of stomach? Most commonly vomiting, hematemesis, and hematemesis, sometimes frank blood can be there, or most commonly it is ground coffee, coffee appearance because of uh, the action of the acid on the blood, there can be uh, uh, ground coffee appearance. If there's going to be a bout of hematemesis immediately, like uh, you know, you know, clotting problem, then there can be frank blood. There can be melina because these uh, bleeding in the stomach can be digested and can be seen in the uh, fecal matter as melina. There'll be retching, the burping, hypersalivation, abdominal distension, abdominal pain, weight loss. These are all the manifestations of disease of the stomach. What are the clinical syndromes associated with the disease of the stomach? You get ac acute gastritis. So this is sudden onset vomiting. The, if you ask the uh, client, when was the last uh, pet normal? You will say yesterday afternoon it had normal food was active. Night it vomited. So this is a classical diagnosis of acute gastritis. Ulcerate and erosion. There will be vomiting, there will be hematemesis, melina and anemia. Gastric dilatation volvulus is most important thing we should remember. It will have non-productive retching and abdominal distension, tachycardia going into VPCs. Most important aspect of so there will be a severe tachycardia leading on to VPCs in gastric dilatation volvulus. And it is a peracute disease if it is going to be GDV. And chronic gastritis is going to be for uh, repeatedly vomiting once. So the frequency can be once a week or multiple times the same day. So chronic gastritis means more than 10 days of uh, incidence of vomiting is seen in a dog uh, with food or bile is a, a diagnosis for chronic uh, gastritis. It delayed gastric emptying. So acute to chronic vomiting with eight to 10 hours after food. So this is again uh, uh, because of delayed gastric emptying. Neoplasia of the stomach, there'll be chronic vomiting, there'll be weight loss, there'll be uh, anemia, there can be hypoalbuminemia because of less absorption. All these things can be seen in uh, neoplasia. But remember, all the problems of the stomach are uh, divided into these sort of syndromes, acute gastritis, ulcerations, uh, gastric uh, dilatation valvulus, chronic gastritis, delayed gastric emptying, and neoplasia. And you can see um, vomiting, which is the most common uh, clinical signs of uh, the stomach. So how many centers are there uh, which controls, uh, you know, which creates vomiting? There can be a vestibular problem leading on to, uh, you know, um, vomiting. You have, a client would have brought the dog in a car for about 10 kilometers. The moment he says it vomited now also, it can be due to a vestibular problem not be a problem of the stomach. So we'll have to go ask him several questions. <clears throat> Just because he's saying it is vomiting, 
so you should not start treating him for gastritis. CRDZ, the uh, you know center, which is purely uh, the highest center, which is uh, reacts to all toxins, uremic toxins, uh, you know, uh, uh, then <coughs> like you know CKD or pyometra, uh, endotoxinic shock. All these things will stimulate CRDZ center, and the animal can vomit. There are peripheral centers in the stomach and intestines. They are called stretch receptors. When they are stimulated, they will be vomiting. So, uh, you know, uh, you should know whether the, uh, which center is responsible for vomiting, whether it is a CRTZ or a peripheral center or higher center, or, you know, it can, have, it can be a psychological problem, animal is vomiting, or it can be a trauma, it, the animal can be vomiting. Accordingly, you select, uh, you know, uh, anti-emetic, which suits uh, the problem. For example, CRTZ, metaclopramide, ondansetron, maropitan is very good. Vestibular, uh, neclizine and diphenhydramine is very good. And for, uh, you know, um, peripheral receptors, uh, like in the stomach and intestines, you can go for metaclopramide, ondansetron or clopramazine. So depending upon which center is responsible for vomiting, you choose an anti-emetic of choice. So the peripheral sensory receptors, intra-abdominal, stomach, intestines, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, peritoneum, kidneys, ureter, urinary bladder. Anyway, there is going to be uh, stimulation, it can uh, uh, vomiting. Okay. Uh, hard and large vessels via vagal nerve, they can be uh, vomiting. Pharynx via glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, you know, it's uh, brought about uh, vomiting. Stimulation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone, uremia, erythrolyte imbalances, Toxins, drugs can bring about vomiting. Vestibular inflammatory disorders or motion sickness can bring about, uh, you know, uh, vomiting. Higher central nervous system like psychogenic or inflammation, CNS lesions, trauma, all this can bring about vomiting. Overall, cats, adverse reaction to food, infectious agents, most important vomiting in the cat, you should think about panleukopenia, and feline infectious peritonitis, whenever it's vomiting. So for acute gastro uh, gastritis. Chronic vomiting, inflammatory bowel disease, adverse reaction to food, liver disease, uremia, and hyperthyroidism. Have it in mind, cats hyperthyroidism is very, very common. So what are the diagnostic approach? As usual, thorough history, the physical finding, the clinical, uh, clinical pathological testing which you do, the diagnostic imaging, endoscopy, this is the way about to go about diagnosis of uh, gastric diseases. So non-gastric diseases which causes problems, we should be able to first recognize while you are dealing with them because clinical signs are similar. So hypoadenocortisone, Addisonian uh, disease, this you should always have in mind uh, when you think about gastric diseases. Liver uh, dysfunctions. So liver dysfunctions again can be uh, a source of gallbladder problem or liver disease can stimulate vomiting center, can uh, show vomiting and can be, uh, you know, sign of uh, GI diseases. So you'll have to think about uh, liver diseases for which you do pre and post prandial bile acids. While so far we have not been doing much of this uh, bile acids, I think it's high time veterinarians should start doing bile acids. Okay, so bile acids is more indicative of the liver disease than your SGPT, SGOT, serum alkaline. They are also important, but I will deal with when you are dealing with you know, next to next Sunday, we'll be dealing. Then we'll see how they are useful in uh, defining. But definitely uh, pre and post prandial bile acids are very important in diagnosing liver disease. Hyperthyroidism in cats, total T4 is excellent uh, diagnostic mode hyperthyroidism in cats. Pancreatitis, amylase, uh, PLI, and uh, TLI, uh, pancreatic specific um, you know, uh, immuno, uh, trypsin-like immunoreactivity, both can be diagnostic of pancreatitis. Intestinal disease, serum, cobalamin, and folate biopsy, wherever you think about, uh, you know, uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you can think about uh, serum cobalamin, folate, uh, folate, of course, biopsy. 
So when you come to acute gastritis, ingestion of spoiled or contaminated food, foreign objects, toxic plants, I told you, you should know what are the toxic plants in which is common in your place or which is present in your, uh, uh, you should ask history of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, plant or what are the plants he has. It's common plants like ivy, like uh, Diefenbachia, then, you know, lilies for cats. These are highly poisonous for, uh, uh, you know, pets. Especially uh, young pets uh, tend to, you know, uh, uh, bite and play with these sort of plants. Generally, adult dogs will not uh, consume toxic plants. Young dogs will destroy and bite and then get toxic. So you have to be th think about them. Chemicals, drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they all can cause acute gastritis. A thorough uh, history is paramount in trying to find out what could have caused severe acute gastritis. Dogs are, uh, you know, have indiscriminate eating habits. So most of the times, that is the most important reason for acute gastritis. There's acute onset of vomiting, food and bile are typically vomited. And um, usually small amounts of food, specks of spots of blood or push larger amounts, anything it can be, uh, they can be, uh, vomitors can have blood, it can have food, it can have only frothy uh, white uh, matter, or it can have bile, anything can be there in case of acute gastritis. They generally, they are uninterested in food and may or may not feel sick. This is again a very classical picture you get. In regeneration, the animal will feel very happy to go and eat the vomitus back. That is a regenerated metal back. But in case of vomitus, the animal doesn't show any interest in going near the vomitus and it doesn't have any interest in eating. That is most important in acute gastritis, uninterested in food. and uh, But otherwise, it will be active. So diagnosis, history and physical exam findings. And the most important thing is uh, nil by os, that is don't give anything orally and parenteral fluid therapy is enough for uh, getting it back to normalcy. So that is the most important thing in acute gastritis. Nothing by os and parenteral fluids, most important. Maropitent is an excellent uh, drug uh, because uh, it can be given intra, uh, you know, uh, uh, can be given uh, Subcutaneously as well as uh, orally, can be once a day is enough, and uh, it's a very good uh, drug for uh, gastritis. When you know when the uh, receptors are there in the stomach, uh, maropitin, and now I think maropitin is available. Of course, ondansetran is again uh, an excellent drug. Ondansetran, 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg. It's available as IV, so that when you put IV fluids, you can put ondansetran. That will set acute gastritis all right. Hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, again, is very, very important. So you should be able to uh, appreciate the difference between hemorrhagic gastroenteritis and uh, paroviral gastroenteritis. I will talk about paroviral gastroenteritis in the next class when I am treating enteritis. Now I, we, we will uh, we will think about hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. See, the hemorrhagic gastroenteritis is per acute disease. Again, if you ask the client, when was the dog pet normal last? He will say, yesterday night it was normal. Today morning it is vomiting like this. This is the very typical of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Though it is said that anecdotal report says the unknown cause, most of the time there are a lot of anecdotal reports that it is clostridium, which is the most important cause of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in pets. So especially when you know you have find pets uh, licking uh, crow droppings or bird droppings like doves, pigeon droppings, or you know it. Uh, uh, it takes uh, bones dropped by these uh, uh, birds, migratory birds. They are the one who, who, who can uh, infect with uh, clostridium organisms. And that will be the most important cause for hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Okay, and they typically cause hematemesis and hematochesia. Smaller breeds are most often uh, susceptible. Rapidly produce a critical ill animal, severe dehydration, and it goes in for disseminated intravascular coagulation that is called DIC, acetemia, pre-renal acetemia. So it can be presented with severe dehydration and acetemia. And if you see the abdomen, they can have petical hemorrhage, which shows it has got DIC. That means it's in shock. So you have to treat it urgently. Okay? Severe case animal may be moribund by the time it is a presentation. 
So diagnosis, typically EMO concentration, more than PCV of 55% with normal plasma total protein and, um, you know, um, the onset, the clinical signs are more important uh, in diagnosing this content. And most of the times, there'll be acetemia. Acute onset of typical clinical signs plus market emo concentration, you know, should start treating them with multiple, uh, I mean, uh, huge amounts of fluids. Thrombocytopenia and renal or pre-renal acetemia may be seen in severely affected animals. So treatment, aggressive fluid therapy is initiated, treat, treat prevent shock. DAC secondary to hypoperfusion, that's the most important pathophysiology of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Renal failure secondary to hypovolemia. So there is hypoperfusion, there is hypovolemia, there is dehydration, which is the main pathophysiology of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. So aggressive fluid therapy, uh, therapy consisting of, uh, you know, um, um, both colloids and uh, uh, ringers lactate and uh, antibiotics because there will be a bacterial uh, relocation in case of severe hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Both uh, aerobic and anaerobic organisms will be there. Uh, typical choice will be ampicillin, uh, potentiated ampicillin with uh, metronidazole will be a potential uh, drug of choice uh, to treat uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. So, of course, if the patient becomes uh, severely hypoalbuminemic, then you can go in for colloids. Next is uh, chronic gastritis. So you have this is inflammatory disease of the uh, stomach. It can be lymphocytic, it can be plasmocytic, it is not it can be granulomatous or atropic. All this thing can be a sign of chronic gastritis. The typical uh, clinical, uh, I mean, the history will be uh, on and off vomiting uh, in the pets which is brought to you. Say regularly it is vomiting, doctor, once or twice a day or once in two days. There has been vomiting, it's very uh, uh, not active, uh, you know, uh, this sort of vague clinical signs will be uh, told by the client. Nothing per acute will be there. So this is a very typical of uh, chronic gastritis. So th this is all infiltrative disease of the uh, stomach uh, mucous membrane. It can be lymphocytic, plasmocytic, eosinophilic, granulomatous, atropic. And to have a final diagnosis, you require definitely a biopsy and most often a uh, helicobacter uh, organism might be responsible for your reaction in most of the animals so chronic gastritis you should think about uh, always about helicobacter there are different uh, helicobacter species in, in dogs but the most common uh, helicobacter pylori helicobacter pilis, these are all the common helicobacter you come across in day-to-day -day practice and what are the clinical signs severe hyporexia and vomiting not eating, vomiting are the most common signs in affected dogs. Frequency of vomiting varies from once weekly to many times a day. So that, uh, you know, history alone will be varying. And some animals only demonstrate hyporexia, ostensibly because of low-grade nausea. There are no big, uh, nausea, no hypersalivation in chronic gastritis. Animal will not be eating normally and, uh, you know, uh, will be dull. 
So chronic gastritis, the diagnosis, most often uh, ultrasound uh, is uh, very important for diagnosing uh, chronic gastritis. There is uh, the three layer uh, um, uh, which uh, seen in a normal ultrasound of the intestines and stomach will be missing in uh, case of uh, gastritis. There will be a mucosal thickening in chronic gastritis. And of course, if you do a biopsy, uh, endoscopy and biopsy, then you can uh, uh, diagnose uh, what site or what type of um, uh, infiltrated disease, is it lymphocytic, plasmocytic, or whether it is eosinophilia. And uh, in fact, for most of these uh, infiltrative diseases, uh, the steroid is a mainstay. So if you are not having uh, endoscopy and biopsy, <coughs> any chronic gastritis, you can uh, definitely go in for steroid therapy. So diets low in fat and fiber, like cottage cheese and potato, uh, is very good for uh, chronic gastritis. Then helicobacter uh, associated diseases. And uh, helicobacter infections are, you know, asymptomatic otherwise, except uh, the occasional vomiting, uh, you will not have any uh, other uh, clinical signs. Sometimes you may have nausea, anorexia and vomiting associated with lymphocytic, especially neutrophilic infiltrates. Yeah, of course, uh, gastric biopsy is currently required for diagnosis of helicobacter, where you can actually see the uh, infection, or there is urease reduction uh, test, where you take a biopsy and put in a urease medium, it changes in color to red color, that is indicative of uh, what is called urease reduction test. That can be done. It's also available in uh, most of the human labs. So helicobacter can be definitely uh, diagnosed, taking the help of them. And uh, the treatment can be a combination of metanidazole, amoxicillin, and bismuth. It also comes in a combination of drug for helicobacter in humans. Same thing can be used. Pemetidine has been used for uh, treating uh, the inflammation, uh, inflamed uh, you know, uh, stomach, and to protect them from uh, acid uh, secretions. Zithromycin and clarithromycin are being used in cats. Uh, some animals seem to respond to erythromycin or amoxicillin alone. So a protecting potential amoxicillin alone also is, is okay for helicobacter sometimes. Of course, only one important thing is the therapy should be uh, done for at least for 14 days to eradicate helicobacter from the stomach. Gastric outflow obstruction. This is again a very common problem uh, which you see in our practice. It can be pyloric hypertrophy. It's what we call as pyloric stenosis. From the stomach to the duodenum, there is a pylorus which is uh, stenosed. Or gastric antral mucosal hypertrophy. The body of the uh, stomach getting hypertrophy. Or gastric foreign bodies, gastric dilatation valvulus. Uh, partial or intermittent gastric valvulus, that is again another one where you don't have acute uh, presentations. Idiopathic gastric hypomotility and bilious vomiting syndrome. All these things are all uh, outflow obstruction problems which we come across commonly in our day to day practice. We may be missing them, but definitely uh, we are seeing as very common. Benign muscular pyloric hypertrophy is called pyloric stenosis. Vomiting in young animals, especially brachycephalic dogs, vomit food shortly after eating, and mostly projectile. So usually we say there's a reason no this uh, clinical signs sometimes will be confusing. Projectile vomition is a hallmark of you know central uh, problem, CNS problem. If you have a trauma or a CNS problem, you'll have projectile vomition. Or uh, here you also have a projectile vomition in uh, pyloric stenosis because there's a buildup of uh, fluid in the stomach which uh, uh, pressure increases so much the lower uh, esophageal sphincter releases and it has a uh, projectile vomiting there can be hypochloremia and hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis in case of pyloric stenosis and uh, the diagnosis by barium contrast enhanced radiographs ultrasonography is again very helpful Gastroduodenoscopy again is uh, very uh, diagnostic for this pyloric stenosis. Of course, uh, most important, you can try uh, medical treatment, otherwise, surgical correction, 
what is called a pyroplasty is a, a last uh, resort for pyloric stenosis. So you can see the distended stomach is due to uh, is a uh, is a clue to search for under uh, underlying anatomic cause of vomiting. You find that there is a, you know a, a reverberation artifact because of a gas, and you also see a fluid, and you can see the thickened uh, gastric wall. All this thing can be seen in this. When you have gas filled stomach, you are usually you don't find a uh, fluid, but in case of here here you find the fluid. Uh, so, and again, the transverse image, you can see the hyperechoic pylorus. So, a very, very classical picture of uh, pyloric stenosis, which is not uh, difficult to diagnose uh, ultrasonographically. And the sagittal image of the thickened pylorus with fluid-filled pyloric andrum. Andrum contains, uh, you know, you see the dark point that is your anechoic area is andrum. And the ending is the, uh, the um, Hyperechoic area is the pylorus. So we can uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnose uh, pyloric stenosis very easily with case of ultrasound. If still requires a further thing, you'll have to go for endoscopy. Introdosal contrast radiograph is also highly diagnostic. You can see in this picture, after three hours of barium, most of the barium has uh, gone out of the stomach into the distal intestines. But still, there are a lot of uh, some more left in the uh, stomach. Uh, that that means that is there is a uh, good uh, uh, peristaltic action. But still, it is not uh, completely evacuated the stomach. So outflow obstruction is evident from this um, endodosal contrast radiograph with a uh, outflow obstruction. So this is an endoscopic view of the pylorus. This is uh, highly diagnostic. So once you do an ultrasound, you see a thickening of the uh, pylorus, then you find a gas filled uh, stomach with uh, fluid and thickened wall. All these things are highly suggestive. And um, once you do an endoscope, it is highly diagnostic. So gastric antral mucosal hypertrophy is again another uh, problem where you find in the body and uh, before the pylorus, you have uh, the mucosa is hypertrophy. Most often it is idiopathic. Uh, proliferation of non-neoplastic mucosa is the main thing which uh, causes this mucosal hypertrophy. It is seen in small breeds of dogs. Uh, almost similar to pyloric stenosis, animals usually vomit food, especially after meals. Gastric outflow obstruction is diagnosed radiographically, ultrasonographically, or endoscopically. Definitive diagnosis of antral mucosal hypertrophy requires biopsy. Antral mucosal hypertrophy is treated by mucosal resection, usually combined with pyroplasty. Normal medical treatment is not going to set it all right. We'll have to go in for surgery, like how you do for um, pyloric stenosis. Vomiting may result from gastric outlet obstruction, gastric distension, or irritation. Okay, so this is gastric foreign bodies, which is again a very, very common day to day occurring uh, problem in veterinary practice. Uh, depending upon what type of uh, foreign body, either it, is, it stays in the stomach or it passes on to the distal uh, intestines. So it's very important that you see, you, you'll have always a clinical dilemma every time when the dog is vomited, I mean, uh, consumed a foreign body, as this history of consuming a foreign body whether the uh, foreign body is likely to come out on its own or whether they have to do surgery. This, uh, you know, will be always there that, uh, say, for example, once, you know, a dog uh, had uh, consumed a battery, pencil battery. So we were thinking that the lead toxicity, all these problems will be there. But nevertheless, uh, we thought we will wait for one day and we gave, uh, you know, uh, pro-candidate drugs and uh, the next day it had passed out without any uh, problem. So it depends on, you know, uh, clinical, uh, uh, this is when you take, whether you do a surgery or whether you allow it to come out or uh, whether you can do it endoscopically is green. Endoscopically is non-invasive, so you can always take it. So gastric foreign bodies are very common. Form a vomiting will result from gastric outlet obstruction, gastric distension or irritation. Any of these three things can have, either there can be a severe obstruction, for example, a foreign body like socks, that will be completely occluding the pylorus, then there will be vomition. Or there can be a severe distension 
where you know the, the, the uh, foreign body is huge. There can be a distension. Because of distension, there is formation. Because I told you the receptors, stretch receptors, that can cause formation. Or sometimes it can be highly irritating. This foreign body can be a stone, rough stone. It can irritate and cause formation. Linear foreign objects whose oral and largest of the pylorus may cause intestinal perforations. So always remember, these can cause perforation with subsequent severe peritonitis. So palpate an object during physical examination, see it during plain radiographic imaging. Sometimes uh, severe uh, vomiting can go into hypokalemia, hypochloremia. So endoscopic retrieval is the best method if it is going to be a gastric foreign body. There is an endoscopic for forceps, so you can easily remove them. And if there are no facilities, then you can go in for surgery. This is most important. Again, you see them, gastric dilatation volvulus. You see in uh, deep chested dogs like Irish setter, Great Danes. Of course, you see them also in German shepherds and things like that quite often. Especially the clinical science will be very, very, very um, uh, clean. The owner's history will be animal was all right, it ate full meals, it was running about in the uh, lawn, and suddenly it became uh, distinct. So this is a typical, uh, you know, history will be there. And you know it is uh, definitely gastric dilatation and volvulus. Gastric dilatation is a less serious problem. With volvulus, it's a very serious problem. Okay, eating a large volume during a meal, eating once a day, eating rapidly, you know, all these things are all, uh, you know, uh, going to have, a, you know, uh, have this uh, uh, dilatation and volvulus. Okay. Of course, when the stomach dilates excessively with gas, the stomach may maintain its normal anatomy position in gastric dilatation or twisting in GDB. You will see. See, you have a normally positioned stomach where there is esophagus entrance, then there is a pylorus before the duodenum. So in case where it is uh, going to develop uh, distension, the pylorus comes uh, forward and starts slowly rotating. The esophagus twists and the pylorus begins to point upwards and it uh, twists on the opposite side. Stomach twists and pylorus moves to the opposite side. Air is trapped in the stomach and the stomach continues to dilate. And uh, after some time, completely, uh, you know, uh, the pylorus is turned uh, uh, other, other, other side and uh, it entraps uh, the uh, air and all the blood cells are compressed and you know you have a severe uh, uh, problem of you know uh, the caudal vena cover being completely compressed causing decreased blood flow and uh, you know there's going to be a severe shock and if it is not treated uh, properly there can be severe necrosis septicemia shock and death so this is a paracute disease which requires immediate uh, diagnosis and treatment they rich non productively when the owner says it is um, trying to rich but unable to bring out anything, it's a highly uh, suggestive of, especially with a deep chested dog, uh, definitely should think about, uh, you know, uh, GDB. And if there's going to be a severe abdominal pain, uh, then there's going to be, uh, you know, a definite possibility of GDB or at least GDB. Marked anterior abdominal distension may be seen later. So when you take a, a plain radio survey radiograph, you know, uh, the stomach is dilated. You know, you can see the stomach is fully dilated. The whole thing is uh, dilated stomach. And there is a shelf that is because of a valvulus. There's a shelf means that I know the white thing which goes in between, uh, that is called a shelf, where the small arrows are showing, demonstrating that the stomach is malpositioned. So most of the times the radiographs are obtained from the right lateral position, which is uh, better uh, for viewing this uh, shelf. So the treatment, supportive care, and the patient stabilization, surgical correction is the most important thing. Immediate goal is treatment of GDV includes restoring circulating blood volume and gastric decompression. Both are very, very important. The animal is presented to you with severe dyspnea, Severe, you know, gastric compression, shock, all this, you know, condition. So immediately we'll have to restore uh, circulating blood volume and uh, treat the dog from uh, shock and correct the gastric uh, compression. 
correction of hyponolemia is done by iv catheters 16 to 18 gauge iv catheters placed in the cranial jugular and cephalic vein most important please take a note down it should not be done in iron lens saphenous it should be done in jugular or cephalic because the vena cava is rotated and it is blocked it will not go for circulation it will cause more problems so you will have to go for jugular or cephalic vein and the shock rate is 90 ml per kg of uh, crystalloids so immediately you should give 90 ml of uh, crystalloids that is ringer's lactate and you can mix colloids at the rate of 10 to 20 ml per kg body weight along that is attached charge you can go you can go for dextran also if uh, the it's not long uh, delay and there is no uh, dic or anything you can go in for dextran also otherwise better to go for uh, eta starch okay flow by oxygen is very important because you can go in for uh, ampicillin potentiated am ampicillin amoxicillin is an excellent drug uh, during and after surgery also it can be continued and uh, gastric decompression which is very very important the moment that uh, the dog is brought to your clinic you attempt should be made to pass the orogastric tube okay which can be performed after sedation with uh, fentanyl or hydromorphone uh, intravenously uh, with or without diazepam the stomach tube is measured from the incisors to the last rib mark it and slowly uh, apply a lubricant and uh, introduce the tube into the esophagus okay uh, into the mouth uh, often held open with a roll of tape or bandage material so that it doesn't bite and swallow the uh, tube so that, and all should be done in the uh, sitting position so that the tube can pass into the stomach there is no twisting of the uh, tube while you are passing some resistance is typically encountered in the esophageal gastric uh, sphincter uh, because there is rotation so gentle manipulation or counter clockwise movement of the tube may be necessary to allow passage of tube into the stomach but caution must be exercised because it is possible to perforate the esophagus with the tube once a tube enters the stomach gastric gas rap rapidly escapes if you are not able to produce um, put a gastric tube uh, into the stomach because of severe distortion of the um, you know uh, inlet then you have to perform gastrocentesis immediately okay that is very important the area tensing or tensing over the right abdominal wall is better place caudal to the last rib and ventral to the transverse process is clipped and aseptically prepared and percussion of the area should reveal a tympani this helps avoid accidental puncture of an overlying spleen you know that the spleen is on the right side therefore inadvertently you should avoid uh, puncturing the spleen so you uh, palpate percuss and see if it is tympani and uh, if it is going to be distended fully then you put a you know a tube either a needle or we can put a over a catheter can be put over the needle catheter can be put okay and um, uh, immediately the air will uh, pass out and uh, you know uh, distension will come down then once the distension comes down once the decompression is done then you can put the orogastric tube and do a lavage on the stomach because uh, the the whole stomach is under you know severe uh, you know uh, compression uh, all along so there will be a lot of toxic materials a lot of multiplication of bacteria and things like that toxins uh, all will be accumulated so gastric lavage is very important so surgical correction and gastropexy is the final uh, rewarding uh, uh, thing for uh, gdb okay gastric dilatation you can attempt to treat them medically partial or intermittent gastric valvulus dogs with partial or intermittent valvulus do not have life threatening problem like gdb okay so chronic intermittent potentially difficult to diagnose problem so it may occur repeatedly and spontaneously uh, they resolve they resolve they come and resolve themselves dogs may appear between bouts some dogs have persistent non distended valvulus and are asymptomatic plain radiographs are highly diagnostic the partial intermittent gastric valvulus is diagnosed 
surgical repositioning and gastropexy are usually curative. Okay, next is idiopathic gastric hypomotility. Again, these are all uh, rare conditions, but still you will have to think about uh, when there is a motility problem is a lot of the idiopathic gastric hypomotility. Anecdotal syndrome characterized by poor gastric emptying and motility despite the lack of anatomic obstruction, inflammatory lesion or other causes. If you find there are no obstructions, there's no inflammations or other causes by all other tests, then you should think about idiopathic gastric hypomotility. Vomit food several hours after eating, but otherwise feel well. Weight loss may or may not occur. Of course, for this, you uh, need the fluoroscopic studies, uh, you know, uh, where you document decreased gastric motility. Okay, so wherever there is a referral uh, practice, you can uh, uh, send for fluoroscopic studies. Uh, of course, you have to rule out the other uh, gastric outlet obstructions, infiltrative bowel disease. Again, similar signs will be there. So all these things have to be ruled out renal problem, maternal problem, hepatic, and you know, all these problems should be ruled out before you diagnose idiopathic gastric hypomotility. Metachlopromide is a good drug to improve gastric hypomotility. Cisapride erythromycin may be effective if metachlopromide fails. Low dose erythromycin can be very effective. Diet slow in fat and fiber promote gastric emptying and may be helpful. So what is important in idiopathic gastric hypomotility? It's a differential diagnosis of uh, obstruction, inflammatory lesions, and other causes before thinking about idiopathic gastric hypomotility. Otherwise, response to metaclopromide, cisapride, and erythromycin, which improves the gastric uh, motility, will be a diagnostic of idiopathic gastric hypomotility. vomiting syndrome again this is again a, a common uh, you know occurrence in day-to-day uh, -day practice the client will say early morning it is vomiting uh, yellow vomitus okay, so this is gastrointestinal reflex that occurs when dog stomach is empty for a long time this occurs due to feeding uh, you know only once a day and overnight uh, not feeding anything so this causes uh, bilious vomiting otherwise the no dogs are always no normal once it vomits daily so this is a typical uh, history. The uh, class of the pet vomits bile stained food once a day, usually late at night or in the early morning uh, before eating. Rule out obstruction, uh, GI inflammation, uh, extra alimentary tract diseases. Feeding the dog an extra meal late at night to prevent stomach from being empty for long periods of time is often curative. So advise the owner to give, if he says only bile, bilious vomiting is there once or twice a day, then you uh, uh, advise the owner uh, to feed it twice, uh, late night once, and uh, prokinetic drugs like metacropromide can definitely uh, stop this bilious vomiting syndrome. Gastrointestinal ulceration and erosion is called glue. The stress ulceration, usually we find whenever the animals are ulcerated, this you find in uh, you know uh, multiple uh, pets, uh, you know uh, sledge dogs, these sort of dogs where they have uh, reasons to stress themselves out, such, such of those, um, you know, dogs can have uh, this glue. Or uh, hypovolemic septic neurogenic problems uh, after uh, trauma, surgery, and endotoxemia can result in glue. So you will have to find out what causes this stress and uh, uh, gastrointestinal ulceration and erosion. This is very important. These ulcers are typically in gastric antrum, body, or duodenum. Uh, okay, so um, so NSAID is a major cause of uh, this glue. Uh, use of uh, steroids and corticosteroids combination is uh, thought to be most important in causing this uh, ulceration and erosion. Mast cell tumors may release histamine.
so it can cause uh, severe gastrointestinal ulceration and erosion. Renal failure seldom causes glue, but hepatic failure seems to be an uh, most important cause in dogs. Inflammatory bowel disease uh, again uh, can cause uh, glue, and hyperoxia is a principal sign. Mostly, the animal doesn't eat. If vomiting occurs, there will be hematemesis. Anemia is most uh, pr pronounced. Hypoproteinemia, edema, pale mucous membrane, weakness, dyspnea are all. Uh, very uh, prominent in case of uh, ulceration and erosion of the gastric mucosa. Melina is seen. Most of the dogs, even though without severe glue, do not demonstrate pain. Perforation is associated with signs of septic peritonitis. Sometimes this uh, erosion can go in for perforation and cause severe septic peritonitis. Some ulcers perforate and seal over uh, generalized peritonitis appears, before generalized peritonitis appears. In such cases, a small abscess may develop at the site causing abdominal pain. So again, um, you know, um, this is easily uh, diagnosed uh, ultrasonographically. Uh, you can see the crater um, uh, in the pylorus and you can see hyperechoic depression in the gastric wall and the adjacent wall is slightly thicker and less echogenic than the near field wall. And on the right side, you can see a large flat hyperechoic depression in the stomach wall. You can see almost at one inch white, uh, you know, uh, spent. that is hyperechoic area. Uh, and the adjacent wall between the arrow is not thickened. So this is very clear that where this arrow marking is not thickened. So this is very uh, typical of uh, erosion and ulcers. Okay, again, this is a longitudinal ultrasound image of the pylorus. Again, you can see, uh, you know, uh, stomach was moderately fluid filled. The focal thickening as well as the deep crater uh, will be noticed in the long tunnel ultrasound. Endoscopy is the uh, most sensitive and specific tool for diagnosing uh, ulcerative erosion uh, of the gastric mucosa. So symptomatic therapy of this uh, ulcerative erosive uh, stomach disease is, you know, uh, acid titrating antacids or uh, it's two blockers and uh, proton pump inhibitors. Aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide. Please carefully look at what the dose is being given and please look at how many times you have to give. It is not once or twice uh, all these antacids are given. It should be given five times to six times daily for a proper action to have. And the dose is, you know, as per given table, uh, you know, 10 to 30 milligram per kg body weight. That, you know, just see amount of tablets you have to use if you are using antacid tablets. So please remember this dose is very important and the number of times you give uh, antacids are much, much important. Otherwise, what happens? It uh, creates reflex acidemia. Okay, so that is more uh, dangerous than the present problem. So you'll have to give a uh, number of times, more number of times when you're giving antacids. Of course, uh, H2 blockers like semiridin, dinitidin, you have been using promotidin, all those things you can use, uh, you know, uh, the dose given and the interval given. And proton pump uh, inhibitors like omeprazole. Omeprazole is an excellent drug because it's given once daily. Uh, so it's an excellent drug uh, for dogs. <clears throat> Infiltrative gastric diseases. So mostly it's a uh, Gastric uh, neoplastic infiltrations like adenocarcinomas, lymphomas, leomyomas, and things like that. And uh, they all uh, produce severe, uh, okay, ulcerative uh, disease, disease like glue. So, uh, because of direct mucosal disruption. So, there is uh, going to be hyperoxia, there won't be any vomiting, there will be only non animal not eating, uh, or there will be gastric outflow obstructions. Okay, the weight loss is very common. Cachexia, especially whenever the tumor is there, cancer cachexia is very obvious. And hematemesis, melina, again, are very uh, uh, important uh, diagnostic uh, criteria for infiltrated disease of stomach. So you can see the different ultrasound pictures of uh, gastric uh, tumors, okay, lymphomas. You can see the lymph nodes, uh, 
uh, you know, all those things you can see when you're doing ultrasound. You can see the thickened walls of the uh, GA tract. So gastric tu uh, uh, tumors mainly are adenocarcinomas in the pylorus, uh, most often uh, predisposed in Belgian shepherds, bull terriers and things like that. Leomyoma seen in the cardia and beagles, leosarcomas and lymphosarcomas are seen, uh, you know, but uh, age is again seven to 10 years. So median is around uh, seven to 10 years is a medium uh, age for uh, expecting gastric tumors. So most important uh, diagnosis is melina. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, vomition because outflow obstructions, uh, not taking food, dull, uh, hypoalbuminemia, uh, canker, uh, cancer, cachexia. These are all the serum alkaline phosphatase increase. These are all the typical, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, clues you get and of course, uh, your ultrasound uh, and um, if you are doing an endoscope is uh, highly, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic. And once you do endoscope, you can take also a tumor in a biopsy and find what type of uh, tumor it is. Generally, GA tumors are not uh, so, uh, you know, good for surgical assessment because they metastasize easily through splanchnic circulation. So it's very difficult, but still, uh, you know, to increase uh, uh, number of uh, years it can live and still attempt to do uh, tumor with uh, chemo, provided you know what type of tumor it is based on biopsy. So this is the uh, typical endoscopic uh, view of the ulcerated uh, you know uh, tumor you see in the gastric wall. So with this uh, uh, we are finishing uh, gastric diseases. Uh, if you have any doubts, uh, I'd be more than happy. So in general, esophageal disease, uh, you have, uh, you know, um, most important megaesophagus, esophagitis, esophageal, uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflex. And um, we have seen what are the, uh, you know, uh, problems you associated with uh, a case of um, stomach, GDV, and uh, gastritis, acute gastritis, chronic gastritis, uh, all these conditions. So if you have any doubts, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much for the patient uh, hearing. Chat box one query is Onden Citron should only be given in any contraindication like incompatible with RL. No, 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 no. It's, it's compatible with that. Only thing when you're giving Onden Citron, no obstructive disease should be there. Okay. You can give with the ringus lactate, no problem. Is there anybody who's saying uh, should not be given along with ringus lactate? No, sir, we, we usually do with that. Our that ringers selected. We do that. So next is, uh, can you highlight the general treatment protocol for HGE? What is that? Hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Yes, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Yeah, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis is a paracute disease where, you know, there's a severe um, uh, dehydration, hypovolemia, uh, and the animal is brought in shock with the uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So most important thing is we'll have to restore the fluid. So we'll have to go in for 90 ml of crystalloids and 10 to uh, 15 ml of colloids to re restore the blood volume so that shock is relieved from shock. And also you'll have to go in for potentiated amoxicillin because there will be uh, bacterial population uh, growing in these compromised uh, mucosal uh, uh, cells. So you'll have to go in for um, this one. And in case it has got severe, uh, uh, you know, uh, dick, then you'll have to go for uh, transgenic massage. 
because you know you sus uh, uh, suspect there can be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, emboli so you can go for transanemic acid if you find lot of pedicle hemorrhage then you can go in for transanemic acid the one question is how to manage gastric tympani due to licking shampoo in kitten <clears throat> kitten okay that only uh, any anti flatulent uh, antacid will do good okay uh then uh, if only gastric dilatation can we treat it medically or need to go for decompression and lavage gastric dilatation you not go for decompression because there is not, not much of distinction seen there but definitely we will have to go in for uh, gastropexy for the long run if it is repeatedly coming we will have to go for gastropexy fluid of choice in severe vomitions any gastric disease in any gastric disease normal saline is a fluid of choice in gastric disease because there is going to be loss of sodium chloride and even case it becomes hypokalemic you have to add potassium chloride otherwise normal saline is good uh, one question is how will we differentiate regurgitation and vomiting regurgitation and vomiting they are entirely different i believe yes yes totally different so that is most important to uh, decide whether it is a esophageal disease or a disease of stomach Regurgitation is a hallmark of esophageal disease. There, the act of vomition is without any efforts. Without any effort, a tubular cast of food coming is a regurgitation, and it most often occurs immediately after taking food. And most often, the food is undigested as it is taken. Same thing will reflect, and the pet will uh, uh, will want to eat it again because it's hungry. It has brought it out because of esophageal problem. It wants to eat it again. there will be tendency to eat again but whereas uh, vomition it will have uh, retching it will have hypersalivation it will uh, take some time delay there for uh, vomition to occur after food and uh, the, uh, the pet will not be interested in uh, licking the vomitus again so these are the typical here and there we will have to make a uh, you know very careful diagnosis because i told you in case of diverticula and fistula of the esophagus the food gets entrapped in the esophagus without going to the stomach where they get digested partially by the saliva and it is brought out like vomition after a time delay so there may be a time delay in certain cases like uh, you know where there is diverticula or uh, fistulas so we have to be very careful in that so kindly explain procedure for gastrocentesis gastrocentesis is done mainly for gdvs the right side the you know uh, uh, penultimate uh, intercostal space the last rib uh, ventral to the transverse process where there is severe tympani you can put a needle to remove the gas gastrocentesis for fluid is here near the umbilicus in the ventral abdomen this is for purely gastrocentesis for gdv for removing fluid synthesis doing uh, abdominal synthesis i won't say it is uh, gastrocentesis it is abdominal synthesis that is near the umbilicus on either side of the uh, midline but here the gastrocentesis is purely procedure done to decompress stomach on the right side most importantly and if the right side the distinction is not much left side paracostal area where there is distinction you can put a needle only thing is ensure highly tympanic area you should put a needle either a needle or a catheter over the needle catheter can be put sir how can we approach a dog with indigestion of large quantity of chocolate chocolate uh, <laughs> if it uh, recent duration uh, you will have to induce uh, vomition either or telephonically you can ask them to go for hydrogen peroxide or 10 to 15 ml orally repeatedly 3 to 4 times if it is okay in the telephonically if they bring it you can try uh, xylazine or if a time gap is there for more than 3 uh, 4 hours then should have got absorbed you can go in for uh, activated charcoal these are things which we can do or symptomatic treatment how to differentiate ascites due to gastric system and cardiovascular system yeah very simple here uh, you know um, uh, in um, gastric um, i mean ascites due to gastric problem you will have to do echocardiography mainly to uh, diagnose congestive heart failure uh, you know vegetative vegetative endocardiosis mitral stenosis all these problems can be diagnosed only through echocardiography okay that is number 1 number 
the, where there is no facilities for echo, abdominal fluid send, uh, can send for uh, protein and cells. If there's going to be high protein, high cellular content, it is uh, post hepatic, that is a heart, cardiac. If it is medium cells and medium protein, it is hepatic. No protein, no cells, it is pre hepatic. Okay, that's great piece of information, sir. That is really good. Uh, uh, one more is which hemostatic injection you advise in uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis? No need of any hemorrhage when uh, uh, hemostatics in hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. They are self limiting. And the next question is uh, which antibiotic best result in HGE? So, best is uh, my opinion is um, as when uh, uh, potentiated amoxicillin is best. If you think there is uh, there's going to be a translocation of bacteria, you can also add metanidazole because the anaerobic organism also will be there. Poriprim or amox good for edgy? Uh, someone yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, one is how can we delay the surgery of persistent right aortic arch? So it should not be uh, delayed. If the puppy is in stage of accepting anesthesia, we should do it. That is the only main concern for us. And uh, it should build up some uh, body to withstand surgery. If dog is vomiting only after solid feed and liquid diet is not causing any vomit, can we expect mega esophagus? And after how much time of vomition occurs in case of mega esophagus? Mega esophagus, less than two hours, it will vomit. Okay. Uh, and you know, the uh, typical uh, normal survey radiography is enough to diagnose uh, mega esophagus because without obstruction, if there's going to be dilatation of the esophagus, it's mega esophagus. Right. Sometimes, sir, ondocetron induced diarrhea isn't. Sometimes, rarely. Most of the drugs will have side effects. Nausea will be there, diarrhea will be there. That is acceptable. Uh, so, uh, there is a question, treatment protocol for ascites due to cardiac problem. I think this will should be covered in cardiology, I believe. Even otherwise, also it's okay. It's just only this one, no uh, inotropic agents, uh, lazilactone, and uh, no drugs, you know, that, that's the main thing. You are, you, are, uh, you know, uh, NWAS, uh, Lasix, uh, this two is enough. And yeah, if you want to will also do. Prima Benda. Benazapril? Huh? Benazapril, yeah, of course. Benazapril. Benazapril is excellent drug. Yeah, of course. Actually, Oriel licenses produces Benazapril. Yeah, Benazapril. Benazapril is better than Enalapril because it's uh, renal protective also. Benazapril yes. is better drug. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. Uh, zinc phosphide rodenticide poisoning line of treatment. So you have to give vitamin K? I think vitamin K, high dose of vitamin K is yes. recommended, I think. What should be the food advice in gastrointestinal diseases? So you can go for a hypoallergic diet. Okay. So that is best. And low fat, high energy, like cottage cheese, like that you can go. Sir, Orihil Life Sciences produces a recovery diet which has got highly digestible protein and carbs, and it is very low in uh, fat. Yeah, and that it is has a, got all essential amino acids and minerals and vitamins. That should be the best thing to do immediately after uh, Sven. And uh, the best best uh, diet after, uh, you know, uh, vomition, uh, bout of vomition and uh, diarrhea is uh, chicken and rice. Why? Yes. Why? Because they don't provoke acid production. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one question is, sir, in parvo need any parental styptic preparation to control bleeding and roll atropine sulfate in parvoviral enteritis? No, anyway, I will deal with this next question. It doesn't require. Anyway, I will deal more uh, in parvo because there's a total change of thought in uh, how we treat parvo and how it should be treated, which next week we will definitely see. Uh, vitamin K doesn't work in zinc phosphide, sir? It works. works. All these things are uh, related to uh, the clotting factors. Uh, the liver uh, responsible clotting factors. So vitamin K is very important for zinc phosphide. 
uh, I think the last question is, is milk advisable in dog after vomiting? No. No? Milk, milk is not at all advisable and definitely in vomiting is not advisable. It's a gastric irritant. Uh, sir, do you recommend subcutaneous fluid therapy along with IV in parvo? No. I think no. 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 Because you want the uh, fluid to be in the vascular compartment. If you are giving it subcutaneously, it is going to make things worse. It's better you don't do anything. That itself is better rather than giving subcutaneous. Subcutaneous. See, if you give wrong fluid therapy, it goes to the interstitial tissue and cause problem. Here you are giving directly interstitially. So definitely, undoubtedly, you should not give subcutaneous. If you are not able to get the vein, you have to go for the swim and trans, uh, like in the, you know, through the bone marrow. Uh, some quick questions. Is chicken and rice best food for feeding after vomition? Yes. Uh, normally, milk is advisable for dogs or in general, it is not advisable in advisable. dogs? No, not advisable. Not advisable. Is ethamsilate advisable in parvo? Not much. I don't think ethamsilate has got anything to do with uh, parvo. Okay. So with that, we close this session. It was a wonderful uh, Sunday evening and thank you very much, Dr. Nambi. You were always wonderful. You have been always wonderful. Uh, and a uh, lot of new uh, knowledge has been added to our uh, 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 encyclopedia. And uh, this session will be available on our YouTube channel later on. And if you want to ask any question, uh, you can send uh, this to directly us or uh, Kanika, or uh, we can get uh, you connected with uh, Professor Nambi because he is not very, you know, he's a very busy man. So he can he can't answer all the queries all the time, but you can send your queries to us and we can uh, enlist them and then we can send it to him and he can answer them according to his convenience and then we can send it back to you. So thank you very much everyone and see you on the next Sunday 3.30 p.m. Till then take care. Happy learning. Have happy learning. Thank Bye -bye. you. Uh, thank you Dr. Sharma and I think I forgot to thank uh, uh, Kanika who's yeah. more responsible for all these things. I thank her also for yeah. everything. K Kanika is always but there sir, to help us. Like every time I am calling my wife, you are calling her. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank bye. you. Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye.